And now we will have a panel together uh, with uh, three great speakers. Um, uh, so one representing, let's say, uh, banks directly involved in EPI programs like Joris Hensen, who is the co-lead EPI program at Deutsche Bank. We also have Marcos Zakariadis, who is chair of financial technology and, and famous economist on this topic on EPIs, uh, regulations, and, uh, and, uh, and, and platform uh, business model. And we have also Adedeji Olowe, uh, who is trustee at Open Banking Nigeria, who will also give us another point of view about what's, uh, uh, what's happening uh, outside UK on, on Open Banking. So I invite the three of them to come on stage. Yes, the beautiful technology here. That was, that's really nice. <laughs> Thank you very much for being there with us for uh, this panel about uh, it's all from open banking to embedded banking. What does that mean for real? Uh, I propose we do a quick uh, uh, roundup about uh, you, your background, what do you think about the topic, and then we'll dive into more, more questions. So let's start with you, Yoris, for example. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I have initiated the API program at Deutsche Bank in 2015. Uh, Way before, actually, it was clear what would be coming with PSD2 with the idea to open up the bank and allow partners to access our data and build new products for our customers uh, and their customers. Uh, we have started on the technology side of the retail side of the bank. And this is also where my background and I'm coming from, from the technology side. But I'm a strong believer that APIs only enable the business models. Um, so um, I like the topic we are talking about here because I see in embedded finance another evolution of the business model. Yeah, thank you, Royce. Uh, yeah, good start, <laughs> good setting for setting up the stage. And then, um, uh, Marcos, maybe we can uh, have you uh, right after, just to say for when, as panelists, when you are not speaking, let's put ourselves on mute so we don't see hear any echo. Absolutely. Um, Thanks. Thanks a lot, Magdi, for the invitation. It's great to be back. Uh, well, my name is Marco Zahayad. It's my background, as Magdi said. Um, I've, I've studied the economics of technology and financial services sector for about 15 years now. And um, open banking or opening data within financial services was one of the key topics we have been studying for six or seven years now. So we've published a lot of papers trying to think exactly what Joris mentioned about the business models, right? How do you utilize ABIs in the context, both regulatory context, but also even beyond that? Um, how do you monetize them? How do you come up with new business models and ideas that create new revenue streams? And, and I'm a very key observer all these years of the industry efforts, um, not just within the UK, across, uh, but in, in Europe as well, but but uh, in different parts of the world. And I think we, we have seen quite a bit of diversity, but I think the bigger banks may have struggled a bit more than kind of originally expected. So I'd love to hear Joris's kind of input in terms of how Deutsche Bank is trying to, uh, to tackle some of these big questions around monetizing um, you know, those APIs and commercializing those APIs and creating new business models, as we say, right? And also from our data G in terms of the regional diversity, right? Because there's a lot to learn, I think, um, from, from different parts of the world. And, and all these years, I'm, I'm still surprised at the kinds of innovation we see in different places. So much variation, so much variety. Yeah, thank you, Marcos. And uh, yeah, this is one of the reasons we also have Adedeji with us. So please, Adedeji, have uh, some comment about uh, where do you speak from? Uh, thanks so much. My name is Adedeji. Um, my background is mostly engineering, deep into engineering. Uh, that's for medication. But uh, professionally, I've been financial services all my life. Uh, everybody wonders why I'm not switching tires or, or building cars based on my experience. But financial service is kind of interesting. I've uh, spent about 16 years in largely Pan-African banks like Access, UBA, and Atlas Mara. And uh, past my uh, banking career, I've been deep into fintech and technology investing as well. Uh, so, of course, Africa is an interesting place uh, when you look at the fact that maybe we missed out on a number of foundational technology. But technology itself, as it's evolving, gives us the opportunity to kind of leapfrog. And that's why, uh, together with a number of industry professionals and uh, some of the big force, we created uh, 
open banking in Nigeria in 2017, which at that time made us the first country uh, privately led uh, uh, open bank initiative. Uh, we work with the central bank and other regulators. Uh, a regulation was passed February this year, and we continue to work with the central bank to develop uh, what the standard will be. Uh, but for us, largely, what, what uh, two things uh, drove our idea about open banking. The first one is financial inclusion. So Nigeria is a very big space. We've got about 200 million people. But out of that 200 million people, we have about 40 million and off with the access to financial services. And we believe that by creating open banking, we can solve a different problem with financial uh, financial inclusion. And beyond that as well, everybody has been seeing the number of innovation that you mentioned within the African space. And we know that open banking, we... Uh, we build the foundation for the next level of financial services, open finance, insurance, pension that we haven't seen yet. So I think the best is I had for everybody. Oh, uh, you may want to unmute. Matthew, me. you're on mute. Yeah, the most pronounced sentence of the last one year and a half, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, thank you very much for telling me that. And Joris, uh, we we'll start by with you about, you know, um, especially so in Europe we pushed this idea of open banking via regulation, uh, you know, PSD two, and and this idea of open banking was there. And the word open may have scared a lot of managers about, yeah, what is to be open? And now let's say we see a shift to what we call embedded banking. So my first question to you, you the the three of you, is. Like, is it really different? Either a mindset shift or is just the same thing with another name? Joris. I think it's an evolution, right? I see uh, it all started with open banking. And in our case, for instance, we started actually before PSD2. And it was exactly like this. When you talk to managers and they heard the word open and banking in one sentence, they were kind of shocked, right? As if you suggest to open the data center so that everyone can walk in without any security. And I think um, I think that laid kind of the foundation. And, and I very much think uh, open banking or embedded finance nowadays is related to an internal transformation. I think with this whole regulation and more and more banks open up themselves, this was kind of the first step, right? In order to allow third parties to plug in, to access the data, uh, for instance, for transaction data and to just display it. And I think embedded finance goes one step further, right? It, it makes banking products more invisible. I like what Simon said this morning. Huh? If, they, if they are really implemented, they become a ubiquitous part of, of the consumer's everyday life. And uh, we as banks, for instance, we have the possibility to uh, reach customers in, in way different areas of their life than we used to be so i would say it's clearly an evolution uh and linked to open banking as an overall transformation journey of us as banks yeah thank you and maybe i'll jump back to adedeji on this on this part because nigeria has a regulation now on open banking or uh that has been late uh, compared to uh, late that came after uh europe uh, but it was one of the first let's say, a non-European country to, have, to to invest in, to say, look, we need to do something about that. Uh, but did you see it happen, the, the embedded banking part, you know, compared to open banking uh, before the regulation came up? Like, can you tell us what did you experience? Uh, so our experience has been based on the fact that we knew we had to do this, right? And we also knew that without the force of regulation to back this, it's going to be difficult to do. Uh, because you know what happened in the UK, without uh, the CMA coming around with a beef stick, this would have happened at all, as well. And I think one of the interesting things that uh, made the UK experience to be kind of uh, very significant is the fact that beyond the fact that it was P PSD2, the CMA uh, made sure everybody followed a single standard, which is what makes it open to start with. Now, you are not seeing that in Europe at all, because you now in Europe, you have fragmented API uh, standard, I think at the, uh, the last count, like about 10, which ad actually has made the growth of open banking in Europe to be kind of less uh, interesting or hasn't seen the kind of traction we have in the UK. Now, we knew we had to dodge that bullet in Nigeria. So beyond the fact that we, the industry could actually write its own standard for itself, which is what we did, we worked a lot with the central bank to make sure that a regulation comes out. Which a regulation comes out, it means everybody has to walk the straight and narrow. And that's been our experience. So 
by and large, we believe that any other country that wants to do this thing uh, is going to always be very difficult to rely on the industry to come together by itself. But maybe by the time we have maybe half of the global jurisdictions covered with open banking, it, whatever has been done that is successful may end up becoming a template for others, and then they might follow it. But at the early stages, without the force of uh, a regulator behind it, it's going to be significantly challenging for any uh, country or jurisdiction to go uh, operational with open banking. Yes, and, and, and you, Marcos, you've seen with your uh, research also uh, uh, background, you've seen really wide really wide uh, um, uh, models and patterns. Like, do you see a difference between open banking and embedded banking in economic point, on the economic point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I, I'd agree with Doris. I think, you know, embedded banking or benefit finance is kind of the, the natural extension of uh, having in place open APIs in the financial services kind of ecosystem, right? So it's one of the solutions, one of the ways you could utilize those kind of implement APIs to uh, find yourself in, in front of the customer in a more kind of embedded way uh, on products that sit out, outside, um, let's say, your own product stack, right? So it's, it's about being visible, it's about being present and being part of that customer journey. And that's why we say it's embedded um, because, you know, it's part and parcel of, of what is there for the customer to, pur to purchase and the service to purchase. But if, if it's not the only, I, I would categorize it perhaps in the broader sense, it's not a business model, but I would categorize it more of a, like a business model because obviously these APIs can be utilized in many different ways, right? So you can create a platform business model and ecosystem around the organization that you are kind of more conscious that you give access to the data to a third party, um, which, you know, it's been consumed kind of outside, completely outside, let's say your, your own organizational boundaries. And then yet, you know, other ways, other business models, you can think around opening up APIs and having these APIs readily available for third parties to use. So, um, so it's, it's the next natural step, but also it's one of the many things, one of the many choices, you know, organizations that have APIs and finance, um, can choose. So that's, I think that's my take. And as uh, Adediji said, you know, having an, a solid API infrastructure, it's really important to, um, to, to build any solution on top of it, right? So open bank is not about the APIs per se, but, you know, they're a necessary facilitator, they're a necessary technology to enable kind of all these interactions, you know, embedded banking platform, business models, other business models, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think indeed the UK is, is one of the um, unique cases, a paradigm, really, on how you can set this up at the national level. Um, yeah. So my question then is, uh, about embedded finance or embedded banking, embedded insurance, uh, is it really just about APIs or is it also a mindset, a culture? Is it about customer experience, uh, these, uh, developer experience? Like what, what's all the whole package of, uh, beyond APIs, right? That's, uh, that's behind uh, embedded finance. I don't, I let you go the one who wants to answer that, but maybe Joris. Yes. Uh, I think it's, uh, I would like to say it's four layers, right? So it's definitely about the technology, about building um, the foundation with technology. So uh, I like what Marcos just said, that at the end of the day, it's the same set of APIs you could use for embedded finance, open banking, or uh, banking as a service as another evolution maybe, right? But on top of this, you really need to build the developer experience. Um, so this is something we invested a lot of time into, for instance, in the developer portal, we have a a sandbox, we have test data because we realized, right, developers want to start quickly, they want to check out what is the offering. And yeah, uh, we have um, some realistic model, realistic test data based on uh, the user behavior. So it's, it's a fantastic thing to check out for the developers who are just listening. But um, we, we realized it's not everything, right? So on top of the developer experience, you also have to consider the partner experience, because a lot of the time, it's not the developers who decide whether or not they use the data you offer, but it's a product manager in a startup or a larger corporation. And they also have to understand. So what is it that you can do with the help of banking data? And in the beginning, I realized it was a lot about education because people were quite surprised that banks suddenly open up themselves. And I feel like, well, maybe now that the, the, the term PC2 is more well known before that, 
it was like a small bubble and you had to do educate the product managers. So you need to have something the product managers can work with. And in our case, for instance, it's a quick uh, prototyping, co-creation, stuff like this. And then uh, last but not least, uh, I think the fourth layer is the customer experience. You really have to take into account and why all of this requires to work on eye level with the partners because you do have to understand the context the partners using the data in. Do you have to understand the use case? You have to see, do we have enough data? Do we have to work on something else, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, the customer does not talk about embedded finance or <laughs> open banking. They want to have a smart solution in their life, right? Uh, and I think, uh, so that's it. So it, I would say it's uh, technology, developer experience, partner experience to design an excellent customer experience. Yeah, um, maybe I did, do you have a point on this? Did you see any uh, difference just beyond APIs with the Nigerian ecosystem? Uh, so for me, when you look at uh, what we call uh, this embedded thing, uh, I think I want us to take a step back to how the internet used to be and the services we had before uh, we got to where we are. So case in point, in the olden days, if you want to send an email, you have to log in and into your maybe your Hotmail or Yahoo or whatever it is, and send the mail. Now, you notice that right now, practically every enterprise application or whatever has emails embedded within it. We don't even think about it, but the underlying services are the same. So let's take a step back and say, look, you're talking about open banking. How will it be? It's still going to be, when it, it's going to be part of the customer experience, but the foundational APIs and standards and structure and regulations will be what will make it happen. And I feel maybe in five years' time, we wouldn't even be using any of these terms anymore. And uh, within the African ecosystem, I think it's going to be the same as well. It's just going to be transparently amazing. Yeah, we name it for now, just to try to explain it, but when it will be obvious, like we will say, oh, it's just, just apps. It's just yeah, absolutely. What, what what do we call emails within apps today? If you log into your maybe your SaaS platform and you're able to send a mail to a customer, what do you call it's it? Embedded email communication system. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, it's emailing. Yeah, it's it's emailing. And actually, I I, I remind Twilio's main uh, Twilio is an SMS and and uh, uh, and communication API. And they were saying at some point they were not saying we're an API for that. They say we make your app talks and text users. You know, it was really, it's not about APIs, it's about capabilities. And so when capabilities are there, we, we don't need to name them, we, we use them. Uh, so, uh, so Marcos, beyond APIs, what do we need? We need, um, do we need entrepreneurs also to, to, to network and partner with new, or new open systems? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it's, it's really what, I think Joe has described um, or started to describe. I think it's it's a strategic choice for an organization like a bank institution, for example, what kind of data they will open up to, to third parties so they can embed their solutions and having this kind of uh, data sharing or, or data exchange to, uh, to utilize and, and monetize some of these relationships. Um, so, but, but beyond that, you'd need more inspiration. You'd need to see how these data can fit in, in what context, how they can be used to help sell your own products or, you know, on their part and make decisions, for example. Um, and so the more data you open up, the more imagination and creativity you can provide to external developers and other brands that want to sit on top your, of your infrastructure. Um, and I think, you know, there, there is, you know, obviously this theory in economics, we talk about network externality. So typically the more uh, data you would open, the more you will bring in, um, you know, third party solutions. Um, and this will create this kind of data feedback loop because you'll become better and better in actually um, measuring the effectiveness of these data sharing techniques or the, the different types of data you have, which will then allow you to, to even kind of more um, uh, supply more data or different kinds of data to provide even more opportunities for third parties and so on and so forth. So it's kind of like a virtual circle, uh, which can happen actually at many different layers within the organization and many different kinds of uh, two-sided, let's say, networks. Um, so, so this is, you know, this is kind of like um, uh, the basic idea, I think. And, and for the banks, 
you know, I think they would need to start thinking beyond the regulatory APIs. I mean, the regulatory APIs are kind of history in some ways right now. And if you put the infrastructure and all the effort in for the organization to have the sandbox, you know, kind of the test data and so on and so forth, you might as well try and open up a bit more because you want to create more opportunity. You want to create more interactions with third parties. This could be your way forward that in the future you can profit and benefit, you know, a lot from. But I would be very keen, actually, to see, um, you know, if there's any examples, life examples, like perhaps Joris can, can um, you know, devote a few minutes and share some of these if, if you know, his, uh, you know, has clearance and, and allowed to, to speak for some of these. Um, but very interesting to see kind of live cases of how these open APIs are being used in action, especially from the bigger banks. And what are some of these kind of examples we can see of creativity uh, you know, third party is kind of utilizing these uh, these APIs and embedding, you know, some of these uh, banking solutions to their own kind of customer experience journey, right? Yep, and uh, we've seen this morning uh, Simon Turns uh, shares with us his is a, uh, a vision about like the seven two trillion dollars opportunity who are there to be embedded. You know, banks and insurers are not. Uh, use traditional channels, but they will be in every everywhere we need them, uh, in uh, whatever uh, uh, wedding planner apps or real estate agent apps or whatever, uh, hotel booking uh, for insurance, whatever. At, we will reach maximum potential of this opportunity. So yeah, the opportunity yeah. So, there. Matthew, just on that point, absolutely. You know, this is the this is the trajectory, right? That's where we we all want to um, try and go. But this actually requires a lot of effort you know the infrastructure needs to be there the apis need to be there they need to be reliable they need to be easy to use they, it needs to be you need to see these integrations and relationships with third parties as your potential customers not necessarily even your partners because you're selling data access you're selling even sometimes certain insights but you also kind of monetize you know you directly or indirectly right it doesn't have to be cash at hand but you can increase your sales through some of these communications and channels. And, and there are some fintechs that we've seen. I don't know if we can share examples here. Like Klarna does that very well, right? In every single site I've been in the last few years, uh, no, last few months actually to buy things. I mean, I can I can really see that the solutions, you can actually have the choice to buy with, uh, buy now, pay later kind of uh, schemes that, you know, potentially people would provide through Klarna. So, um, yeah, so these are, but, but I would like to hear more examples. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, Marcus, you're trying to get to the fact what are the real examples in order to, to prove the point? Is there a real business model, right? So, and, and, and what I can say, I mean, first of all, I have to say, I really like what you said. You have to think beyond regulation because this is where the, this is one of the key ingredients. And also, like maybe what you said, we require this entrepreneurial spirit because we can no longer think in terms of this is IT, and this is business. We have to put our product hat on and, and think of what is possible with the data we have. Um, so, I mean, to give you a few practical examples, um, since we have started on the retail side of the bank, we, we started with all the account information, credit card data, saving account, right? So the first um, corporation we entered was uh, through the hackathon we did back then to launch our product. It was a German-based startup called Finanzguru. So for the German-based audience, you can check out their app. Uh, it uh, helps you to get a good overview about your financial situation, provide you with tips um, to save more money and also uh, some, some uh, recommendations to switch insurances. So um, what's the business model here is that uh, because of our API, we were able to enter into a partnership and now we acquired a share on this company, right? Without the API and without going beyond the scope of regulation, we would not have been able to enter this partnership. Or another example, we have a corporation with a tech software provider named Bool. It's also a German corporation. But uh, with the connection through your bank account, you pre-fill a tech statement. I mean, who does the, like the, doing the tech statement, right? So we want to ease the process, make it faster. It's a nice example of how you can offer an additional value to your customer that you might not have offered without a partnership. Then if you look at the corporate side, I think it's, it's like, also feels like a natural revolution, evolution that we started with regulation on the private side because suddenly the corporates who also have a private bank account started to think what is possible with data. And we had uh, corporates, small sized, medium sized companies who knocked at our door and said, are you able to provide you, you, uh, me with 
my bank account data because I have a lot of manual Excel files, stuff I have to upload, self-developed systems. So we pri provide exactly this as an additional service, right? In on top of their, their account. And if you look then for the bigger corporations, we clearly see the trends that large corporations ask for ways to handle payments more uh, transparently, notifications, liquidity planning. So it's a huge opportunity. And in particular, if you look at the existing client base and to offer those additional services through partnerships. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's some cases you see, and I still think we need many more cases to really prove the point. Okay. This is what you estimate. And this is the example, uh, but still, I hope a lot of our senior stakeholder watched this presentation this morning. <laughs> Yeah, let's hope. Let's hope. Uh, we've invited them. Let's see if they attended. Uh, Adidig, you, you on in, in Nigeria, uh, with all these entrepreneurs uh, and new tech entrepreneurs and the current, let's say, uh, 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 banks and incumbents, like how how do you see it coming? How do you see the, the relationship, the new features or the new apps uh, being shared and, and, and used by, uh, uh, by the Nigerian citizens? Like, can you tell us a little bit how it's structuring itself? Okay. Uh, the API business in Nigeria is transforming. Um, in, in the last probably one and a half years, uh, companies doing that deep into APIs have probably raised about $50 million. So this space is super hot. And this is even on the back of the fact that even the, the proper regulation is yet to kick off. So now, so you ask yourself, if investor has taken in like $50 million on, on a number of... Uh, uh, API uh, players, even without the regulation. Now, when regulation comes, it makes the game to be even more interesting. And then you ask yourself, what is driving this? Credit is driving a whole lot of this. And uh, so in terms of players, we have a number that have uh, gone the way of Think or Plaid, uh, using innovative ways, or uh, maybe screen scraping, to be able to connect to banks and share this data uh, with other customers. But unfortunately, what we know is that uh, despite this kind of uh, interesting play, the banks are not seeing any of the any of the revenue at all. And I know that over a period of time, banks will come around and say, "Okay, let's see." Uh, either we get involved or we shut you out. Uh, but we also know we have precedents in in the US and also in Europe when uh, uh, people push against screen scraping and uh, intermediaries even before PSD two to say uh, they are legal to do it as long as the customer is one giving consent. I don't know how that's going to play around in Nigeria because I know that the bank, the central bank is quite protective of the banking space. So let's see how that goes. But what increasingly what we're seeing right now is that uh, banks are interested in API banking, which of course obviously is going to be powered or kind of uh, catalyzed by API uh, open banking. And why do you say so? Because there's a lot of pressure on the other revenue sources, uh, pressure on credit, pressure on the traditional digital payments. Uh, so, but API is becoming interesting. Um, recently, one of the tier three banks today is like, has become the, like the industry leader in API services, providing transfer data and verification APIs to a number of fintechs. So we see that as the other bigger banks continue to see these smaller players uh, having success in this space, they will invariably get involved. And also when open banking comes out, uh, we also see pressure coming to on payments, revenue from payment from the bigger players like Intercity, Paystar, Flutterwave. Uh, we strongly suspect that when the uh, open banking regime comes out, uh, they will be forced to find a ways to make, uh, look, with all this valuation and pressure from investors, they will be forced, forced to also take a look at how to make money from open banking and APIs and data. Yeah, I will also uh, include some questions from the audience uh, right now because my next question was like, okay, banks are opening uh, uh, systems to be embedded. And funny enough, I was talking to a, a CEO of a, of a UK bank uh, last year uh, about like in open banking. And I was saying like, look, the goal, the goal of the regulation was to have banks opened. But the goal of banks is to be embedded, is to go beyond and just openness. So that was the goal. Uh, don't mix the goal of regulation and the goal of the business. Uh, but behind that, what's the current state of the relationship with fintechs? How banks are currently working with fintechs? Do they need to be to 
to fear uh, some some threats from fintechs? Do we need to work with them? Do we need do they need to invest in them early and uh, and and put seed money directly into these fintechs? So how this relationship should be? And and this I also have a question on on uh, about that, which is uh, with embedded finance, are we closer to incumbents becoming the back enders? while BinTech and FinTechs own and interact with the customers. This is the only relationship we're, we are able to do, or do we see something else happening? Maybe Marcos, you can start on this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a really good question, actually, Mehdi, because uh, uh, even as Joyce was presenting his examples, I was wondering, I mean, of course, the, the narrative around FinTech and bank competition has changed. I think, you know, in the beginning, there's a lot of, competition and competitive threats and the big banks kind of thought that fintech would potentially kind of disrupt them. Um, it's never happened, at least not in the way a lot of people thought. There is still some competition, but I think in terms of stealing some of the market share of the bigger banks, that's that's way um, much, much smaller than, than um, uh, perhaps some would have hoped. Maybe even the regulator who put uh, forward some of these regulations, um, basically on the base of competition. But anyway, I think there's a lot more collaboration because of uh, the existence of APIs and availability of APIs. Now there is there is kind of a more natural tendency to try and find these um, you know interesting partnerships where people and fintechs and banks can benefit and so win-win kind of situation and try to monetize this as as much as possible. Now it's interesting how the these kind of partnerships result into what kind of new dynamics and relationships. For example, I mean, George mentioned some of these examples. Um, and I, I was just thinking, how do you monetize that relationship with the API? Is that kind of a revenue share, revenue share basis? Or, or does the bank indeed have to have a stake in the um, in the organization that they partner with in order to kind of indirectly kind of monetize? let's say that relationship, right? For example, I give you access to the data, you get give you access to my customers, and in return, you'll grow and you become a successful FinTech. Uh, and, and I only can capitalize through the relationship if I have a stake in you, and then I can, you know, I can be rest assured that you're not gonna go rogue or, you know, take over my market, et cetera. And if you do, you know, I'm kind of a shareholder in that sense. Is there a model where uh, we can explore without these, being a necessity in the end of the day, without having you know big banks acquiring stakes for every single fintech they work with, because now of course the partnerships are not that that much, right? So we're talking about a few examples here and there, but in the future, in a more kind of distributed and modular architecture in the financial sector because of APIs, I mean you can't envision banks having a stake at every single partnership they do, right? So then we need to kind of find. Um, we need to hit the, this next level of maturity, try and monetize or make sense of these interactions where there's benefit win-win situations for both, that there is, um, you know, that there's no need to actually have a stake in, in, in this way and utilize what we call more a platform-based business model basis, where it's just interactions, right? And, and there is a particular contract that has been communicated through these interactions where people both organizations can benefit in that sense. And there is some economics and management literature, which we've published a lot. I encourage you to look up my name and look at some of my papers. But there is, you know, there is certain things that you, as a platform owner, say, or an API producer, you need to think about when you have people integrated into your own kind of platform. You need to have certain amount of competition between them. You need to have certain rules uh, and procedures on your platform to make sure that you don't suffer you know, in the mid long term. Um, and we have a lot of case studies also from other industry we explore on that on that particular topic. So I think these are some of the thoughts you know I'd like to share in terms of cooperation, competition, competition. I don't know if that helps at all. No, that helps definitely. And Joris, uh, what's today? How do you, would you describe the the state of the relationship with fintechs? How Deutsche Bank APIs enabled you to maybe work closely or uh, uh, earlier? Uh, with some uh, exciting fintechs that if you didn't have these APIs, like, can you tell us a little bit how it's happening? Yes, so I would say that uh, APIs allow us to to go into uh, a really a phase of co-creation and rapid prototyping. It's not no longer this innovation on PowerPoint slides, but you can really try it out. You can work on a small prototype. You can have a landing page to target directly target uh, pilot potential uh, pilot customers. So, I, I think it changed the way uh, we interact with startups, and I feel like uh, it's also 
the way I look at it, it's both sides benefit of it, right? So we as the bank, for instance, we have an existing customer base, or we can do pilots like this. It's really essential in particular for smaller startups. Whereas on the other hand, we also get a lot of feedback from those potential partners around our data, around our offering. So we learn a lot. Huh? And one, for, and I think it's, I mean, it's easier said than done to talk about those eye level corporations. Huh? And, and the first thing we, for instance, have learned when we uh, started to offer our API is that they, the startups told us, well, if it would take us a year to work and access productive data, that simply don't fly because it's, it's just too long. And this is when at this point in time, we designed our two weeks onboarding process. But for that, you need every instance in the bank to work with you and to understand that uh, why you're doing this embedded finance, open banking uh, from legal to compliance. And then again, it's this involvement of the whole organization, but it's, it's also, I feel it feels more natural the way uh, through APIs because um, you can bring all those functions into the conversations with the startups and they learn and, and while the product or the idea grows, the, also the understanding grows. And also, I mean, uh, what Marcus just said, I mean, it, with regard to the business model, I think it really has many different dimensions. I don't think you necessarily can invest in, in, in any partner and I don't think you need to, but if you think of that with the better your offering gets and the easier it gets to integrate banking data. And then maybe if you look at a broader scale, like health data, energy data, financial data, then maybe it's through this, you become part of other platforms too. And then it's really about this connectivity. And then maybe at the end of the day, you will have a few business models that will be the, the core business models. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think we should fear this visibility too much because Still, I think it's a huge opportunity and the development will happen anyhow, either with the players who join this movement or without. Yeah, I, I was talking recently to a banking let's say, ecosystem, an API manager, who, who and they had a VC fund dedicated to invest in fintechs. And this, he was saying, uh, our strategy is spray and pray. <laughs> you know? So we don't know exactly where it will grow and how big it will be, at least. We want to stake and we try to get a sense, but that's that's not a great sign about uh, uh, you know a manager who knows exactly what's going on uh, there. But at least they have the cash and uh, uh, and and they want to don't miss any opportunity. But as you were saying, Marcos, they will not be able to seize all these opportunities. They will need to to decide. I did G one question uh, that comes uh, when Stripe acquires Paystack two hundred million dollars. What does that change in an open banking ecosystem? What does that change into entrepreneurial mindset or in the current Nigerian banks? Okay, uh, well, fine. Uh, so the first thing uh, the Stripe acquisition did, uh, because prior to Stripe acquisition, it's been mostly uh, investment, but we haven't seen exits. And without exits, sometimes it feels like these stratospheric uh, valuations are bubbles, and uh, we don't know if it's, the model makes sense. And normally, you know, as investor, uh, we care about return. So until and as it uh, has happened, you can't be too sure where this makes sense. Now, when you look at Stripe, which is a global organization, and you know, the guys at Stripe, they know what they're doing, can uh, put in up 200 million to buy into uh, one of the leading payment providers in Africa and in Nigeria, then you know that they must have done some homework because this is no longer an investment. This is a real, uh, I'm putting a stake in the sand. So when that happened, it signals to both local and international uh, uh, observers and investors that look, something is real. Now, when it came to banking, it was shocking. Uh, shocking in the sense that, look, when you look at uh, smaller fintechs, their revenue to uh, their multiples is nowhere compared to traditional banks. But look, I'm an investor, and what do we do? We invest in the future, we don't invest in the past. And basically what international investors are saying is, look, we look at the fact that this is going to be very big. And we've seen this thing happen before. When uh, 20 years ago, we were going to develop the telecom sector in Nigeria, uh, people felt like uh, it wasn't worth the effort. And then you have the likes of MTN, Airtel came in. Uh, over a period of 17 years, dividend alone, MTN kind of uh, freighted away about $8 billion. That's significant when you look at the return. So investors like Stride are seeing those kind of values now. And I get a number of traditional players are worried because they can't see that value. So you, it's like you're playing a game and then you're seeing somebody with you making bets. And then you're asking yourself, what can you see that can't see? So that 
is the big worry for every uh, senior or board level or, or investors today. What are these guys seeing in this fintechs uh, and in the Nigerian future, payment future, finance future that we're not seeing? Because if they're taking this month and the people are start seeing exits, then something is definitely wrong. And when you look at Stripe, it's probably a uh, uh, pay stack is probably bigger than um, majority in terms of valuation, uh, majority of all the uh, Nigerian banks or typical Nigerian financial industry uh, companies. And the return that's been for early backers has also been significantly better than what you have gotten in the traditional investment. So that's where everybody is right now. Everybody's just looking at what happens next. And funny enough, one banking API manager was telling that he was using API management to un to analyze weak signals. You know, when a, a, a fintech is is not re really completely uh, successful yet, but they see some early, they detect early signals of traction, of usage, thanks to the API management they are actually managing on their on top of their APIs. They can anticipate and have early insight potentially about fintechs that will be growing faster than the classic VCs who don't see it because they have the API access. They see how many times uh, the fintechs are consuming and they see the traction, they see the evolution somewhere sometimes VC don't. So that's, uh, yeah, early insights are extremely important for, for investors. We have a question also uh, on, the, on the panel about uh, um, interoperability and the goal and the question from Dan is really how can interoperability across platform work could work without secure and portable digital identity, which is constant driven by the individual or the entity itself. So how do we merge all these ecosystem with maybe an identity layer? How, how do we need to manage it? How it will be extremely important for this embedded finance to be sure we, we log and we recognize and authenticate everyone across the full uh, uh, life cycle. Who wants to start on this? It's a I tough could. one. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, I, I, I don't think uh, the merger will happen easily at the at the base level. What I see happening will be some of the bigger players will come around and provide a kind of intermediate uh, identity system. So let's take a, an example. Sounds scary, but let's say Google. Google will say, you know what? Go ahead and pull in from different jurisdictions your identity, your wallet, your cards, your any form, and you put into me. And then on top of that, I provide a consistent interface that you could now take over to any financial service, any app or financial service player to be able to identify you. So it's probably going to be processed through. Now, it's a good thing with security, especially in Europe, so I can understand whatever is going through the mind of Yuris or Marcos as far as that is concerned. Yep, yeah, your Yuris or... Or Marcos, yeah. do you have any point on this? I, I don't know where the question is coming from, but also like, uh, if you look at it from the perspective, how 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 easy you make uh, it for developers, for instance, to adopt your products, right? I think we should also take this into account. I mean, uh, standards certainly help on one hand. On the other hand, I think it's it's also about applying the same technology you find with other technology providers to make it fast and easy to adoptable, right? So I think this is, this is also a core. No, it's not, not related to the identity directly, but I think generally speaking, uh, I feel like this is an important factor. Yeah, and do you think, Marcos, it will lower kind of transaction costs across the whole ecosystem to have a, let's say, unified identity layers to recognize people, their account and their credentials? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's the kind of ideal scenario to have. Um, you know, if you had an infrastructure which was a utility for every single organization within financial services, that would be brilliant, right? Um, I'm not sure that's going to happen in the way a lot of people think um, it could happen. Uh, but, I mean, this identity, you know, has many different layers. And I think you may hold this identity with a trusted institution. Uh, and nobody else having access to these data, but that's fine. As long as you can transfer and authenticate yourself across the ecosystem with different kinds of systems and interface and refer them to your visa identity in that kind of trusted institution, I think that could also work. We, we don't necessarily have to have kind of a centralized infrastructure that will bring and connect, you know, the, all these identities we have across many different systems and have kind of a unified identity where everybody can rely on. And so the question then is, who is the holder of that 
first is identity, which you use to authenticate yourself across different systems, right? Um, and I think, you know, the banks, the big banks could play a big role in that. Um, I don't think they do it uh, yet, at least not as successfully. So, uh, I mean, the banks could be custodians, not just of money and data, but also of your digital identity. And then you could, you could, you could use that service to authenticate yourself in different um, parts and different even ecosystems beyond financial services, or it could be the government. I mean, it's interesting in Greece, um, which is one of the, the smallest countries across the European Union, and that's where I come from, um, you know, recently the government implemented something like that. So the government is a custodian of the digital identity, and now you can use that online identity to authenticate yourself across different other platforms, external platforms. And so there's no need anymore to kind of transfer all the documentation to prove who you are, you know, prints of your passport and so on and so forth. But this is a role that, that you know, depending on the jurisdiction and, um, and country, it could change who is the stakeholder, who, who are the, you know, the pillars of this digital identity. And I would like to think that banks could play a very central role, but I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, and uh, Indian government also published the Indian stack, you know, with the Ahadar base. Exactly. Uh, you know, like, Having a layer of this is what you wanted to say, Joris. Yes, yes, I wanted to add India, <laughs> added this too. But what I would also want to add, I mean, I think, yeah, we heard about this trans to transfer your KYC, maybe because you want to switch the bank or as a corporate customer, you want to add another bank and you simply do not want to run through the same process. I think that's a cool idea and concept. I would also think, like, to what extent. That, does a customer want to have a single digital identity really, right? Not except like where it's a good place to hold, but is it something the customer demands? And is it maybe the first problem a customer would think of? So I don't know, because at the end of the day, it's maybe about the seamless process. I mean, I like the Indian example for this reason, although it has some, some difficulties as well, but nevertheless, I mean, it, it's kind of a nice example how this triggers additional uh, innovation on top of it now. Yeah, if someone removes the need of passwords, he gets my money. <laughs> no. Well, so, that's a good point, Joris. I mean, it's it's you know, it certainly adds a lot of in you know, and reduces friction transaction costs in the in the ecosystem to have a single kind of this identity, but but it can also be a bit scary. I mean, imagine if everybody could track you across all the different systems uh, as as they see fit in in some ways, and and so I think at least having some. You know, a private even institution, the government, depending on who you trust and how the entire kind of um, infrastructure is set up. And then you choose who do you share and authenticate yourself, you know, and, and share your kind of credentials with, you know, on the on this kind of digital ecosystem, the greater digital ecosystem. So I think that's that's safer and, um, you know, it, it definitely is, is reassuring for privacy as well. So for the Did last three minutes we have, uh, no, uh, sorry, I'm uh, sorry, Adediji, you wanted something, sorry. Yes, if I may just quickly add, so I quite understand uh, Marcos and Yuris, but I will say that, look, uh, if you pick up your app today, your phone today, you have just one, either your Apple ID or Google uh, to control access to almost all your apps. So we are, we are more deep into this, so we understand the risk, but the average person on the street, really, uh, we give up a lot of things, not knowing the impact anyway, in order to have flexibility. And I actually believe that look, the likes of Apple, Facebook, Google, could have, unless there's a regulation to stop them, have potentials to actually aggregate all your identities across countries, ban banking system, and present it as one single interface that an app can always request. I know you're scared about it, I'm scared about it, but the average guy on the street doesn't even know that they're supposed to be scared about it. It's important to, yeah, uh, who will be the device manufacturer, the operating system manufacturer, the app, app store, the application, the API. We'll, the user will decide at some point what they accept, right? But we will see who will be the winner. For the last minute we have, can we try to wrap up with each of you one idea that we didn't share, but that people should look about uh, uh, one idea, uh, you know, important idea that we did, did not discuss about. Who wants to start? I will. Uh, yeah. Well, the one idea I see is with uh, open banking and embedded finance, we see financial services becoming like a commodity. I, I think at the beginning, the banks will actually be the winners because they have the uh, regulatory power to hold balances and do certain transactions. But over a period of time, I think uh, whatever is a 
the, lack, the DNA or the lack of DNA that allows them to be innovative, I think will come to the surface, which may also force a number of fintechs to, or bigger players to start doing backward integrations to acquire banks or to chain banks as a whole. Now, those are what I think. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I, I see that uh, a, a, as a possibility. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yours or Marcos? Joris, yes. I, uh, okay, good. I, yeah, yeah, I, I can I, go. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Um, well, it's, I think it's difficult to just have one single idea for a closing kind of statement towards the end. Um, there's, there's just so many things happening right now around open banking. I think the, one of the most interesting things we see or we'd like to study at the university um, is essentially the different business models and variation of implementation. So using these uh, and leveraging these um, open APIs. And of course, we're part of all this debate around standardization and this identity. Um, I would encourage people to um, to reach out. They have questions about research and then perhaps even go, go on and read some of the papers. Um, Google um, myself and find a lot of publications around these topics and even just last week we published as part of the world economic forum um the uh, responsive financial systems council we have there uh, the role of these identity and actually being a catalyst of change and transformation in the financial services industry so there's there's a lot of food for thought um in some of these papers so uh, please do reach out if you have any questions thank you marcos and yours last but not least yes so my final thought is it Today we talk about finance, but it's not only about finance, it's about that all the different industries are to open up. We see this, uh, maybe the, the finance industry is a little bit earlier due to regulation, but the interesting point in time will be when we think about what we will do together with all of this data, right? If you combine it to really make a valuable product that fits into the different needs and, and points uh, of life of a customer. And I think, that's the journey ahead of us. And this is the interesting development I hope we will see very soon. Yeah, thank you. In the name of the whole EPRS community with all the questions and comments we had, we really want to thank you, the three of you, Adedeg, Yoris, and Marcos for this panel. Uh, yeah, it's time for to go uh, to lunch, <laughs> right? And uh, yes, enjoy uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll really be back for uh, in 50 minutes, 5-0 in 50 minutes, for the second part of API Days. Thank you, the, the three of you. And Thanks looking for having forward to having you again in another conference. Thank you.